thank you for coming. It's been quite a long wait <laughs> from December till now. So um, just to start, this book was a collaboration of the three of us women from Starbuck. I never planned to write a book. It was just kind of worked out that way. But it was, there was a book done um, in 1982 at Starbuck Centennial by a woman named Wilma Fletcher who did the whole thing without Google. I'm just gonna say hats off to her. And uh, it was a great launch for us to have a place to start. So um, I just wanna say also, welcome especially to Marjorie Penner, who is a Starbuck girl. And she has gifted me with this bell that was from the bank and I'm really excited. Never even had seen this promotion before and very sweet. So um, we'll go on. In the picture that you see in front of you are the three of us who worked on the book. And initially in 2016, we were meeting once a month, um, talking through ideas, what we were gonna cover, how we would organize it, come up with categories. And Carol had done quite a bit. She had a lot of memorabilia that she had collected through the years as people uh, brought her pictures, she'd say, can I get a copy? And uh, most people were really gracious to share with her and she saved it all and had it all pretty nicely organized. And that is kind of what gave us a good starting point was um, we had a lot of pictures and, we, and you'll see a lot of what she had today as I go through. And then Kay Hickey, is someone that I knew through um, family and also um, she worked in the core building back in the day when I was out at the airport. She was a phone operator and uh, we had a Starbucks connection and she's the one who kind of got the ball rolling and here we are. So um, we'll get going. It's a lot of pictures. Uh, I don't know if you're all familiar with where Starbucks is, but it's, it's north of Walla Walla and you could say it's on the way to Spokane if you want to go that way. <laughs> and the train used to. So, And then this is like if you're entering. And of course, the reason Starbuck exists is because of the railroad. Uh, Oregon Railroad and Navigation was uh, putting a line through to go to Spokane. And this was in a strategic spot. And they were popping up uh, where needed because, you know, they had steam and they needed wood or coal or some way to fire them. So this was in a strategic location. This trestle, it was really the way for the railroad to get into town from Walla Walla or uh, Alto or any of these other locations. And um, this is about a 1910 photo where you can see the wood school uh, nearest to the trestle, which was being used, and then the brick school in front of it was being built. And in front of that then is the Presbyterian Church, which is a, an important thing to know. It was the first church, and they are the ones who were gifted with the bell, which we'll get to. Um, and I guess I'll go back and say, Kay just reminded me, I put something on Facebook. There is a Facebook page for the book, and she was talking about crossing the trestle to go sledding. And I did that, and it was a little treacherous in the snow. Um, but then we had bonfires, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, kind of over in the vicinity of where this picture is taken, actually. And a few people went in the river. I didn't. I kind of jumped off. So um, There was a roundhouse in Starbuck, a couple of them. The first one burned. Um, and then there was later a larger one. And the picture on the right is actually the picture on the cover of the book that uh, the cover has been colorized. Um, it's, again, the Starbucks station helped to get, get them into the vicinity of Riparia and Grange City, and it was the route to Spokane. The first ORNN employees assigned to Starbucks station are listed here and they include my grand, great-grandfather, James Woodend, who also became a postmaster. And in that building that you see pictured with all of the horses, the post office is in that building at the time, which would have been close to the depot and the railroad station. 
And since we're talking post office, here are some of the locations of where it's been over the years, and it's still open to this. Right now, it's opening part time, and um, you'll see this picture with the fire truck again because that building. I think you can see where it says post office there, um, but the fire truck was just newly purchased, and and you'll see that again. So navigation was also part of this railroad system. And uh, that was actually how they got goods from Lewiston and on down the river to Riparia where they could be loaded onto the train. And that is a picture of the Riparia Bridge um, that was kind of a critical piece of the railroad at that time. So there's, I'll cover more about that later. So one thing that was a very huge uh, thing that happened in 1893, which is really Starbucks began in 1892 and then 1893, it was really a pretty getting going. I mean, that, that was when the church finished and uh, things were really starting to get going in the town. Well, um, there was a very serious explosion of a steamship called the Annie Faxon. And I hadn't actually heard of the Annie Faxon, but Carol knew about it. And when I got researching it, it really was amazing. Uh, they were just on a routine trip. The, the vessel had been inspected, but there was a pattern of vessels that something about when they were slowing up to make a stop, there was something about the boiler as they were powering it down that caused it to explode. And this was all about pulling in to get peaches and add a passenger and pick up wood for the boilers. And as you can see, really mu not much was left. And it was a very serious, most, most serious actually marine accident in the Northwest to this day. So um, a very sad thing. There were 23 people on board eight people perished, including two Starbuck brothers, John and Thomas McIntosh, who were sons of Mary McIntosh. And uh, the McIntosh family, very, um, very much movers and shakers in Starbuck. And um, they, they managed to save that hull and rebuild. And this uh, is the Lewiston, which was the ship they, they built from the leftovers of Annie. So uh, the steamship era ended in 1940 when the railroad completed the lines into Lewiston and Orofino area. But it was, that's how they got the goods down the river until then. And these are depots. Um, there was another depot earlier that burned in a fire, don't have a photo. And then this depot stood until it was destroyed by fire. And then later this on the right, the more sort of basic depot was there until 1965 um, when the Union Pacific Railroad took it down to get it off the tax rolls. This company uh, became Oregon Washington Railroad and Navigation uh, Company in time because it was adding so many stations in Washington. It was actually purchased by Union Pacific in 1889, but they were kind of operating it secretly and not letting people know all the small lines that they were buying as they were trying to build up their uh, railroad and kind of get an edge on the competition. There were a lot of uh, Chinese workers who laid track uh, for the railroad all through the Northwest, but uh, in Starbuck as well. And they had a lot of gardens in the area, but the Chinese made a huge contribution to the infrastructure really throughout the whole US. Now the construction of Joso or um, sometimes called the high bridge for the Union Pacific now, that actually was built between 1910 and 1914. And actually the completion of that bridge was the beginning of the end of Starbucks rail era because that new route then could bypass Starbuck and took 52 miles off the route. So um, it was kind of an engineering marvel in its time and um, it cost $2 million along with a huge number of human lives. 
And I just wanted to mention too that it's very close proximity to where Lions Ferry operated. And that is a whole interesting uh, segment. It includes, uh, if you're familiar with the Mullen Road, Lions Ferry was part of that crossing to get to Fort Walla Walla. Um, Olive Lyons is a very interesting woman who had, uh, she took over after her husband died and ran it for 30 years on her own with the help of an investor. And then Ruth and Nate Turner, who I knew and who had it from 1945 until when it closed and the highway bridge was built, um, they lived there and made their living on that uh, ferry. This is the Mackay trestle, and I, uh, it's not a trestle anymore, it's now earthbuilt, and I drove this, drove by this, I don't know, thousands of times, and I had heard of the Mackay trestle, this road is called Mackay Alto, and I never even knew what it was, and uh, some research finally turned it up, and it was built in 1881, then reinforced, but then it wasn't reinforced well enough because it had some numerous heavy cars of ore and flour and some other things. And uh, the trestle collapsed under the weight. And there's quite a um, recounting of what happened. But everyone survived it. And then a local farmer took them, got a horse and a hack, and picked them up and gave them first aid until the railroad could send a train to get them and bring them to Walla Walla. And even though Joseph Bridge was completed, they went ahead and um, continued to run this, uh, use this particular rail system until there was a flood in the 60s. This is an example of a train wreck that happened in 1939 in close to the Pomeroy area. I don't know a lot about it except that I know they had something called a train wrecker. I, I mean, it's like a tow truck for trains that got the thing back together and back in service like in a day. It was quite amazing to me because, you know, I mean, this was pretty early on. You know, we're talking in the, this was 1939, but even then, um, you know, the, getting all the equipment and everything to that site would have been something. And I just wanted to throw this in. This is a harvest picture that would be um, the route on 261 that goes by Starbuck toward Lions Ferry. In this picture in the background, there's actually a picture of the pest house, which is where people went to be quarantined if they had a very serious disease like diphtheria, um, that kind of thing. And then their families would have to take food and whatnot, but they were separated from the town. The Starbuck Bell is the oldest artifact, and it was a gift of uh, a really a, a Navy, not a Navy, he was a shipping magnate named William Starbuck. And when the railroad, of course, they were naming things after people who were providing funding, and he happened to be one of them that they named Starbuck for. There's actually three Starbucks named for him, but there are ones in Canada and ones in Minnesota. And then this little bird still exists. And he had promised a bell to the first church. When Mary McIntosh heard that, she got busy, started fundraising. Any crew that went through there that had to spend the night, they got enlisted for labor. And she got that done and, and, and he followed through and sent the town a, bill, a bell. It was picked up, the railroad um, had a, a route down uh, OR and N, down to Portland where it was picked up. Thomas McIntosh is the one who actually picked up the bill, bell and it was only a couple months later then that he was killed in the Antifaxon explosion. So kind of a sad thing um, as I'm researching and realizing the dates on this, it was not that long after he picked up the, bill, the bell that uh, that explosion happened. This is a picture of the little bit more up close and it, it says what is on there. The ring out the invitation clearly for a church. And um, interestingly, that church eventually folded and became the Christian church. They kept the bell, but then that church closed and they dismantled the building. So the bell was stored in my grandfather's barn 
<laughs> until like 1953 when they did a territorial centennial celebration. And then at that point they brought it back out and um, put it in, you know, in the Bell Park, but it was, it's now in a structure. It was really at just at ground level. And this is just the story of what uh, Mr. Starbuck, Commodore Starbuck, that was the name I was coming up with short, uh, what he had to say about it. And he was really a philanthropist and he did donate a lot of different things to other cities as well. And these are the churches of Starbuck um, that have had buildings um, and the only one left now, so we had the Presbyterian and then the Christian, and then what is called the Methodist Episcopal, which I think they shared that building until the Episcopals built the building on the right um, that you see. And that uh, was like in 1910 to 1927, that was where the Episcopal Church met. And then after that, it just became kind of a community church because Spokane stopped sending down clergy. So from then about 1954, it became a village missions church, which is still a community church and is still meeting every week. This is a church pretty close to a current picture and it was, they've had a structural rehabilitation in 1948 and added an education wing in 1964, and then in 2012, they pretty much doubled the size of the sanctuary. And they, they have a pretty good congregation there each week. So the law in the jail, and one thing I'll say on each one of these slides, the pages of where this is in the book can be found. Um, they built this jail, and you can see the sketch of it, it's pretty basic in 1907, the town hall minutes actually include all the information about how much they spent buying bedding and other things to, to uh, add in. At the time, Judd Irish was the marshal there, and Judd was a character. He served as the marshal from 1902 or before, I couldn't find records from before that, until his death in 1907. However, he did not have the luck of the Irish. In November 1905, he was called to be a jury witness in Seattle, and he became a robbery victim himself. He was kind of lonely in a big city, away from home, heard some music playing, walked into a tavern, kind of participated in a little bit of beer drinking, and saw a chair that looked oh so comfortable and took a nap. He woke up wondering, is it time for breakfast? And he went to check his watch and it was gone. So he reported that to the Seattle authorities and was positive they would get that returned to him. But Seattle is a little different than Starbucks. So then he decided he better tuck in early the next night before his court time he locked all his doors, and when he awakened, all of his clothes were missing. So he didn't know what to do, what to do, who's he gonna call, and he opens his door, and there's a bellman there, and explains the whole situation. So not to worry, he goes to the rag bag, gets him a few clothes, not really his size, pretty too small for him, but at least he wasn't there in a barrel. So and he made it to, to the jury, and. I don't know what happened from there, but the articles in the paper, these are like from a Seattle paper, they were not worried about being sued. And the articles are written, are in the book in their entirety because they're priceless. I mean, nobody could have said it better. It was pretty cute. Then in February the next year, he captured a notorious male thief in Colfax. Then to celebrate, he's out doing his thing. Maybe he got a little too much celebration, insulted the wife of a local official, wound up getting put into the same jail as the guy he just arrested. <laughs> so kind of awkward. And then um, a harvest of, you know, the wheat country all around Starbuck. And there was a group of young harvesters who had a goal of drinking all the beer in town and were getting doing pretty well at it, and it was getting wild. 
So Judd tried to get him calmed down. He grabbed a young man and kind of put his arm behind his back, but that young man was way too strong. And he threw him down to the ground and started pounding on him until Judd said, enough. So that was that. But again, um, these papers are, some of those articles are so entertaining. And then another story that I was very interested, Jesse Callahan was shot by Peter Bosler, who was a local, both of them were businessmen, and they didn't get along. And I don't know exactly what happened, but they were fighting over ice. So they, after he was shot, the people nearby gave him some first aid, and he said, I want to go to Walla Walla. The doctors in Walla Walla did not really think he would survive. They said, oh, it's possible, but doubtful. So then I'm like, what happened? Did he survive? And he did. He did survive. And um, he did a lot of different things. As I found different articles of places he'd been, and, and including getting married. And he is buried in the Mountain View Cemetery here along with his wife. So this is a sad story. Um, the only law enforcement officer ever to die in the line of duty in Columbia County was Marshal James B. Smith. And um, he had, it's a, all in the book, but he had gone to get a prisoner to take him to dinner. And the prisoner had an accomplice who gave him a gun through the window, through the bars in the jail. And when uh, Marshall Smith opened it up, there was a scuffle and he was shot and passed away. And it's, it's a pretty sad story about what happened. Uh, he has then been honored posthumously at the national and state level. And the whole story is in there with quite a lot of detail. In fact, Margie Penner was there the night that that happened. So in the Bank of Starbuck um, was built in 1904, and boy, they had a rough start. They had all kinds of things happen. Right off the bat, there was an embezzlement, and uh, you know, quite, uh, people were run out of town, and then there were debts, and it finally got straightened out and was going pretty well. There were two robberies. Uh, one of those robberies included the bank robber locking all of the workers and another patron in the vault. <laughs> so they're stuck in there. But fortunately, the, one of the people who worked in the bank had some tools in the vault and was able to get them out. But it was, you know, the woman who shared her story, which is also in the book, talked about how frightening it really was. It, the bank closed in 1931. It did not really fail, but it was depression time, and it was purchased by the Broughton National Bank in Dayton. In 1931, due to Carl Penner's quick thinking, when the bank closed, it, he bought it and made it Starbucks Town Hall. It is now on the National Historic Register, and in 1993, they did a lot of upgrades and uh, new roof and it's still used today to send out bills for the town and for their meetings. The town government, so uh, Starbuck was officially incorporated as a town fourth class in 1905. Now, I don't know if there's a town fifth class, but anyway, we, <laughs> we got an incorporation. And these officials are just like any other town or city, they have uh, to develop budgets and have different infrastructure needs and proposals that they do, but they also do ordinances. And I came across this uh, ordinance that, that says, the council last night passed an ordinance related to public dances, and Starbuck was well known for its dances. Any immoral dance or dances commonly known as designated and outlawed, the shivers wiggle and twist, turkey trot, Texas Tommy, grizzly bear, rag dance, slip and walk back, the walking dance, Etc. And I mean, just some of the names, you got to wonder what were they doing. But um, they, they outlawed that, and they said, we will not have any suggestive, vulgar, or repulsive manner of dances under subdued lights or dances of like character, so quit it. 
So long before the movie, Starbuck had some dirty dancing, just saying. <laughs> this is a picture from a 1913 atlas that shows the plat. Uh, Mary McIntosh uh, platted the original town in yellow. It, it's shown in yellow. In the pink right above the yellow is the wooden addition, which my great-grandfather added in 1987. And then there were some other additions uh, through the years. This is now, again, this is the bank building, but it is the town hall. And then the utilities. That's a big thing in Starbuck. They got a water system in 1966 during the dam construction era. Little Goose Dam is close by to that. And then uh, the water table is pretty high in Starbucks, so there was contamination happening and they had to do something. And so uh, Carol, uh, Carol Wildman is the one who really worked hard to get some funding and she did some really creative out of the box things to uh, come up with the money. And because they put in a lot of hours themselves, they saved a lot of money and did it for about half of what was expected. But every household was asked to contribute 80 hours of labor, and that could be anything from helping to dig trenches, to timekeeping, to providing lunches, and really the whole community was involved. And Carol, you know, she also received some community awards for her efforts. We do have a lot of community organizations. Back before TV and the internet, people used to really get together to socialize. And there were a lot of different clubs that were meeting weekly, usually. Now, the building in the center, you'll see a definite change. That has all been changed. But that is how it looked all during my growing up years. And it was known as the Rebecca's Lodge, uh, which is a part of the Odd Fellows. <clears throat> and you'll see on the right, there's a lot of memorabilia, and um, it includes their charter members, which included my great-grandmother, and you'll be seeing that building show up here a little bit later. This is the Grange Hall to me, but it was initially Miller's Hall, and it was used for all kinds of community events and entertainment. Uh, the Grange took it over in 1934, and then it closed in 2007. It is now privately owned and really not in good condition. This is the inside of the Grange Hall. That's my great-grandparents there at an anniversary celebration. But it really does a good job of showing the floor where we roller skated on Friday nights and where I spent quite a bit of time on that floor with people running over my fingers with roller skates and not that fun. So, but it was really a community building for potlucks, card parties, uh, lots of dances, lots of music, lots of concerts. And this is a picture of the baseball field, which um, is north of town. And they had quite a, quite a ball team in, in that uh, time. And then it became the rodeo grounds. And they, for a few years, were part of a, a circuit that included Ritzville, Lewiston, and Walla Walla. But Starbuck didn't have lodging or enough facilities for all of the visitors, and they weren't making enough money, so they got dropped. But then in 1978 to 2001, they had Starbucks Buckeye Days and a parade and rodeo. So it, it kind of came back into to life. But then, as with a lot of things, you've got to have people to do it, to do the work, to volunteers. And so then they kind of abandoned that. But now there is a group currently working on getting money to have it restored. And they're doing pretty well because it was just in the paper that they got some money uh, with the help of Skylar Rood. So in 2019, there was an outdoor concert in the rodeo grounds. And um, it was a classical concert, which was beautifully well attended and kind of a surprise because, you know, we're, it's kind of a little redneck town, but um, it was a great evening. Susan and I attended. So this is an entrance into Starbuck and a landmark that um, Kay Jackson's family, she's one of the co uh, collaborators with me, this was her family's silo. And as you can see through the years, it, the time has taken its toll and it is definitely fading away. 
The bottom right hand corner is how it looked this spring. This is about schools. On the left hand side is about the first high school graduates. It was a two year high school. And then that building that I think they're standing in front of is difficult to see, but that is shown in the news article and they were tearing it down to make room for, I believe, a trailer park during the dam construction. It was a landmark, but it, it was in disrepair. And then these are some other school buildings. On the left, you'll see the one that I mentioned from the trestle that was a wood frame building. And then the brick building that um, is in the top center, and you can kind of see the wood one behind it. And on the right-hand side of the picture is the school that has added like an administrative office in the front center and a gym on the back. Then bottom center is the school that we still call the new school, even though it was built in 1969. Sports teams, I don't know the year of this basketball, the famous seven, but they look fierce. And the right side, girls basketball, I thought that was interesting that they did have girls basketball for a number of years. My grandmother and a cousin of mine are pictured in this and I'm just kind of blown away. She never told me she played basketball, but there she is. <laughs> this is the high school uh, whole student body and faculty in 1952-53. My mother's in this picture, my grandmother, so it's kind of a a fun thing to look and we've got all the names pretty well figured out and I have them listed separately but I didn't include it in this. And just a little bit about the school history, there's been a school there continuously all the way till now, even though they have a very low population, they have been so innovative in finding um, ways to offer a small school environment to children who maybe aren't struggling in a bigger school or just want an alternative or maybe there's some other reason and um, they do run buses to Dayton and Waitsburg and to other surrounding areas. This was the old school that you saw that was the first school that became a hotel. John Stoddard was a very interesting and prominent member. He did a lot in the town of Starbuck. He was an attorney, served as town clerk, uh, he was an editor of the Starbucks Signal newspaper. He owned a lumber yard and then this hotel. Um, but he had a lot of tragedy in his life as well. He lost his young wife and then shortly after that, their five-year-old son got appendicitis and died from gangrene. So it, it wasn't all just peachy for John. Now businesses, in the book, you'll find lists of businesses during the time frame that they existed in the timeline, and I don't have a lot of information about them. Some of what I've gathered has just been from ads in different newspapers, but this is kind of an interesting uh, picture of, you'll see this AO hammer. The hammer building still exists because uh, Mr. Hammer got tired of having buildings burn up, so he built a block building for his business. Now, on the left-hand side are pictures of what I remember as Zinc's Grocery growing up and how it looked. And on the right, the Hammer building has been renovated and really um, beautifully restored. And it isn't actually a saloon. It's really just a community building on one end and it has an art gallery on the other. And it's owned by the Bishop family who have done a lot for Starbucks. Some businesses, of course, we had some taverns um, and there is, was a tuxedo tavern there. Chris List was a proprietor and he was, he was a mayor one time. I don't know the whole story there. It was kind of like a one-term mayor and didn't go well. But he apparently was a very good businessman. And he had a system to let train people know, like he, he, he would have a different special at his concession every day and he could ring the bell in a certain way I don't know, two shorts and a long or whatever he did to tell them what it was uh, so that they'd know what they could have for lunch. Now, this is the building that, as I mentioned, was the Rebecca's Lodge. But before that, it was a drugstore, a Starbuck Drug Company. And now it is Rebecca's Lodge Restaurant. And more pictures of 
uh, that and the inside. And then Barnhart Mercantile, to the left you'll see the side of the drugstore or Rebecca's Lodge, and to the right, Sprout Barnhart Mercantile, which was there. This is the inside of the store on the bottom right. Um, that was, unfortunately, that was sent to me after the book was published, but um, very interesting to see how they displayed all the dishes and different hardware items that they had. This is a picture uh, looking again toward the drugstore and behind that sign is actually where the post office is and that would have also been, the, that's the location of the Barnhart store, Barn, Sprouse Barnhart. So you're seeing the bell and then in front, behind the bell I would say is what was a mini mart. It has been a store and different things. You can see the restaurant across the street and um, it just gives you a little bit of view of the town from Front Street looking toward Main. So here's Main Street currently and Main Street during a parade in 1910. They had a, a garage on Front Street, but the one I remember was on Toucanon Street, Eaton Service, and again, a distant relative of mine, aren't they all? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, no longer in business. And they had um, different, many different lumber yards through the years. And Mr. Starr and his blacksmith, I don't exactly know what I would call that, but um, it doesn't look like it would be the place to be during a storm. And fires were a huge problem, um, probably for a lot of towns. I know Walla Walla had a lot of fires as well, but. Uh, the Cinderella Opera House is a building I had never even heard about, and when I just happened to come across it, just became very interested in it. It had been built to replace a building that had, uh, called the Starbuck Opera House, that had had a fire. And then it opened July 16 through 18, 1908, to 200 more patrons for the Opera Cinderella. And then, as I'm going through the paper, just six months later, in January 1909, the, the Cinderella Opera House also burned. And also a nearby barn burned. That also belonged to my grandfather, but they got all the animals out, so that helped. And then that was actually the third hall to burn in a year. And I think maybe that's why the Grange Hall has the metal uh, siding, like so many things had burned. But it was a time where there was a lot of wood-burning stoves and kerosene lamps, inadequate electrical wiring, so fires were a huge problem. But they got a fire department, and there's the fire truck again, and uh, that was in 1953, and then in 1954 they built the firehouse, and they had a very high-tech way of getting people to the fire. They would call the store and Gracie's Inc. would run down and ring the fire siren and then ride on the blackboard where the fire was and they'd get a truck and everybody that was ready went and everybody that got there late would read the blackboard and drive there on their own. So that's how that worked and it worked pretty well. This is just a town uh, picture from a different vantage point where you know, I can see a lot of businesses. On the very right in the center is the Methodist Church, which was just in existence not that long, and um, we do have a date of 1909. Here's another 1909 from looking the other direction, and I remember going across that bridge. It is different. The bridge is in a different location now, and it is about to be replaced again. Um, this picture on the left, you could maybe see a church steeple. That was, again, the Presbyterian Church. You can see the school uh, with kind of the dome bell uh, sort of in just to, to the right center and the Toucanon River behind. So the town is surrounded by the Toucanon River, and so in addition to fires, they had a lot of floods as well. And I thought I'd just show you some homes from the first home and then um, a few other homes that we had some pictures of, just kind of zip through. The one on the left was going to become a hospital 
uh, by Dr. Petrisky, but he passed away before that happened. This is um, the, what, what I knew as the Abraham home, which was my great grandparents' home, but it was probably built by a, for the railroad or someone who worked for the railroad. And then we don't know because of not, there was a fire in Dayton as well and a lot of records were lost but they think that they probably were able to get it for back taxes. And it is now owned by Carol Wildman and it is also Aunt Jenny's B&B named for my great grandmother and Susan Matley's great grandmother. And it's really charming if you wanna stay there. This is Carol's childhood home, she still owns it. Some homes that the government built on Front Street for the core people who don't live there, they're all now privately owned. A couple other houses. Then the surrounding area of Starbuck. This is a pretty good aerial view showing the highway bridge in the center. On the left, you see the Joso or Highline Railroad Bridge. And then on your right, you're seeing um, up toward the top, the Palouse River uh, confluence. Columbia Pulp. Don't know what to say about that. At the time I made these, it was going strong. There's some issues. Hope it, hope it comes through. <laughs> I mean, it was a really great thing for the area. This is a Snake River Ferry with kind of an interesting story. And I do not know that this was the actual Kellogg Ferry. But Mr. Kellogg had this ferry that was located between Starbuck and Lyons Ferry. And then he just wasn't getting enough business, I guess. So he decided that he was going to move to Spokane, which he did. And I, and I hadn't, I kind of found that out late. It was someone in Waitsburg had written an article that I just happened to catch. So I told Carol about it and she's like, well, what happened then? I'm like, I don't know. So I Google him and I say, Isaac Kellogg, Spokane, Washington. Oh my goodness. It turns out that he would, had hoped to build a toll bridge up there, but somebody beat him to it. So he was like, what to do, what to do? How am I gonna make a living? And there were some tribal members there and he began selling them alcohol and it was not appreciated. And he had been warned to stop it, but it was pretty easy money. And uh, so someone shot him through the window of his cabin and he became the first homicide in Spokane County. So, wow, <laughs> okay. And this again, Lions Ferry, um, very important in the area. It was really the only way to get across. And I know when I went across once with my dad to go to Palouse Falls, they put us on and then all the sheep that could fit around us. So, and at that time, sheep cost one penny well, initially, I believe one penny for it per sheep to get across for to change out pasture. Some other interesting, and you can see the Joso Bridge in its proximity. This is a good picture showing the curve in the railroad bridge, which is one of the things that made it so unique and why it uh, held so many records for the height and the length with a curve. And um, I will tell you that my late husband was a surveyor for the Corps of Engineers and before they were gonna raise the pool, um, they had to determine whether there was any movement in, when the trains were going by. So they were reinforcing it and checking all that. And he happened to get caught out there when there was a train that wasn't scheduled because there would be an extra. And he stood out there for the length of that freight train on a little fire uh, build out where they kept a barrel of water because at that time when it was initially built it was a wood structure. So when they did do the reinforcement they found some of those um, footings had deteriorated to where they were almost e not even in the ground. So it's good that in a way that they did or there could have been a really serious problem there. And then on the bottom right is the highway bridge that came and was relocated from Vantage. Marmus Rock Shelter was an archeological site that WSU uh, tried to protect with uh, building a coffer dam, which failed and that site was flooded. But they did learn a lot. 
and um, I know someone who worked on that project and you know it was unfortunate that that happened uh, with the flooding but they did preserve as much as they could. This is again in the area, uh, Lions Ferry has a recreational area and park and then a marina and then there's also a fish hatchery built by the Corps of Engineers and then Palouse Falls, which is now a state waterfall and beautiful. And, and the right hand uh, shows the Milky Way, which I think is pretty beautiful. Here are some other shots of it. And the top right, of course, a very wintry time. And you can see the difference in the volume of the falls. Now this I did not know about, but it turns out that you can sometimes see the northern lights from Palouse Falls. And I have never actually been there at night, but really beautiful. Little Goose Dam, uh, I was employed by the Corps of Engineers and worked there, one of my very first jobs. And it employs uh, probably 35 people now, but they usually don't choose to live in Starbucks. They commute from Dayton, Walla Walla, Pomeroy, um, not too many of them choose to stay in Starbuck. Riveria was a dream of the president of WSU, or W, well, actually Washington State College. And Enoch Bryan had this dream of a utopia where they would use this water to uh, grow really amazing fruits and vegetables. And he did, but he needed more water he bought the power plant in Starbuck and with the intent of using it for pumping water. However, there was not enough oomph by the time it got over the hill because Bavaria would have been located upstream of where Little Goose Dam is now. The interesting thing about it is, had he just dug, you know, dug down or drilled down, uh, that whole area is filled with artesian wells and he could have had plenty of water but he was kind of going traditional and was thinking of pumping it from the river. Um, he then had hoped before this completely failed that he might get some help because he was friends with a gentleman from Pomeroy who last name Cosgrove became the governor of Washington state. However, Cosgrove had a heart attack and couldn't even make it through his inaugural speech, decided he would needed to take some time to recover. And he is known as the one day governor because he didn't recover enough and passed away in California. So the hope for funding for WSU's um, Enoch Bryan and his experimental town kind of died with the would be governor. There are some extinct towns um, that were very important in their time. Uh, Fort Taylor, also part of the navigation system in Grange City, a shipping point. And um, then once the railroad was going, uh, they kind of lost their need for those two places. Just uh, kind of to give you a little bit of an idea of where things lie, uh, according you know, the Snake and Tucannon River, just to give you how it's laid out. Hilly area, very hilly. And then Riparia, as I mentioned, was a pretty important part of the railroad and close to Starbuck. They also, the two towns played ball against each other, so they had that going. And just a little bit about the town. And this um, Stewart Hotel apparently was really well known and, and used by railroads and tourists even alike. And again, you can see the bridge. Just an aerial view of Starbuck. And that concludes. So thanks for coming and for your interest. So, so. Thank you so much, Carla, for giving yeah. this talk.